Here tonight's program, this is a message, or this is a reminder rather, that this episode will address various topics related to mental health, addiction, and a reminder about multiple sclerosis. These may be sensitive to some of our viewers. Viewer discretion, as always, is advised. We remind you to please consult your doctor, your mental health professional, your outreach group, your sponsor, or specialist before adopting any change to your dietary, physical, and or mental health regime. If you're looking for options to go down with respect to mental health, contact SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration at 1-800-662-HELP. It's 1-800-662-4357. The service is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. as a confidential free information service for individuals and family members facing such stressors. Importantly, if you're facing suicidal crisis or emotional distress and need to be put in touch with a crisis center immediately, call the Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. Or go to suicidepreventionlifeline.org. You can also text the word HOME to 741-741. Those resources, those resources are also available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. And then I'd be remiss not to talk about my battle with multiple sclerosis and also where I go to and where many people go to for basically guidance and education with respect to demyelination and multiple sclerosis. In the sense that the, <clears throat> sorry, the National MS Society is a collective of passionate individuals who want to do something about MS now to move together towards a world free of multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis is comprised of unpredictable and often disabling flare-ups of the central nervous system. Such flare-ups disrupt the inf oh, wow, sorry. Such flare-ups disrupt the flow of information within the brain and between the brain and the body. The National MS Society is the largest private funder of MS researchers in the world, investing more than one billion dollars to date. MS stops people from moving, but the National MS Society exists to make sure that MS doesn't. To contact the National MS Society, please call 1-800-344-4867. Once again, 1-800-344-4867. Or go to their website at nationalmssociety.org. Also, we are still raising money for the National MS Society through a Venture to a Cure's fundraising page at rebrand.ly slash adventure to a cure. This is a page that was created in conjunction with the virtual MS Walk on May 1st. This effort will last through the end of the month. Thank you to all of you who have donated money to this amazing organization. It touches me and over to 1 million people in this country that have multiple sclerosis in so many ways. And we appreciate all of you. And on that, let's begin. Change. Sometimes it is the hardest thing we can do in this life. When we realize that something is destroying us or is not working for us, and to be brave enough to say, you know what, we got to change. It is hard to go down that road. But when we do, we find that the change had to happen. Tonight, we go through the process. But I also talk about basically the moments where I realized I really needed to make a change. This is the Venture Forward. <laughs>
Good evening, or good morning, or good afternoon, wherever you may be, and welcome to the Venture Forward. I am John Venturini, a recovering addict of overeating obesity, alcoholism, and compulsive gambling. And it's an honor and pleasure to see all of you on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch this evening. This is a tough conversation for me because it is the synthesis of everything, but also a lot of the reason why. A lot of when I realized that I had a problem, when I realized that there was something that had to be done outside of the physical things we talked about earlier, outside of the fact that I was, wow, class four morbidly obese and had a BMI of next to 70, outside of all that, outside of a lot of those things. There were other things underneath the surface that were on the precipice of all of this. And coming to the realization that this was the time to do it is not as elementary as one would think outside of the physical hurt, outside of all that. We're going to discuss all that tonight. But before I do, I want to say hi to all of you on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. Over on YouTube, we have Jamie who says, hello all, and I don't know why the graphics is so small there. Let me make that a bit bigger so everybody could see the words, hello all. There we go. You can playing tricks on me again. There we go. <laughs> Good evening, Jamie. Uh, Marilyn over on YouTube says, hi, JV and Jamie. Ingi over on YouTube says, hey, I'm listening and making tacos. What kind of tacos? Tacos sound fantastic. Uh, Marilyn agrees with that. It is yummy, yummy for sure. Um, and also on YouTube, uh, we have Sarah who says, uh, who, what's, <laughs> who says, what's on the board? Haven't heard a report lately. We're going to talk about that tonight as well, because there's been a little bit of progress there as well. Um, might as well, uh, might as well start there. Uh, weight wise, I have reached a new low. I am at 187. Well, and we've got graphics. I'll talk about it too. But uh, it is a total of 293 pounds down in this journey. And there are moments where I am sitting here just in absolutely dis absolute disbelief about all of this. But like, I'm just, I'm very thankful and grateful for the journey. And I also know that sometimes it is very hard for me to put words around it tonight being one of those nights. And we're gonna get through this because we have to. This is, this is important information. So I'm sharing this with you. Jamie says, congrats, JV. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. I appreciate that. So when you look at a situation such as mine, we're gonna just use that because it's the situation I know the best, right? I know what I've gone through. I know what I've dealt with. There are multiple things at play that go on with an overeating disorder, an obesity situation, alcoholism, compulsive gambling, basically very much a compulsive set of addictions, joint addictions, if you will. But it was basically a problem where it was paralyzing me. And it's not something where automatically you're going to say, I'm just getting rid of all these things at once. It doesn't work that simply. It just doesn't. If we rewind the tape and we go back to 2019, the first thing that got addressed when it could barely move was the diet. The second thing that got addressed was the alcoholism when I had a night in May that I was horribly drunk, horribly sick, just the night where I said I'm never drinking again. Two reasons. One, the way I felt. Two, it is not plausible nor possible for me to lose the weight if I'm going to continue to drink. So drinking that night in May of 2019 ended. The third piece, which took a little while longer, was not gambling anymore. That didn't happen until 2020, and that didn't happen until the IRS basically said, hey, you're being audited. You know, in the middle of a pandemic. 
Uh, was I supposed to say, was I supposed to say Backstreet Boys reunion to our, uh, ba <laughs> wow, Backstreet Boys reunion tour? Well, oh darn, I didn't. That's what it was. During a pandemic, during a separation leading to a divorce. All of that. Yeah. So it wasn't the first thing that got done. It wasn't the second thing that got done. It was the third thing that got done. But in the course of all that, there was a question about all these joint addictions. And moreover, how much of this was a question of co-addiction, codependency that led up to this? I own what has happened. I own the fact that I had a very bad relationship with food. I own the fact that I have a very bad relationship with gambling, so much so that I can never gamble again. I own the fact that I can never touch another alcoholic beverage again. But there is things that are going on around me, one would say triggers, that caused me to do what I was doing. Doesn't make it right, far from it. But we must not forget the environmental factor of what was going on as well. We're going to talk about all of that. Because the fact is, a lot of people are dealing with this. A lot of people are dealing with compulsion. A lot of people are dealing with addiction. So there are ways to basically try to, you know, try to work around these things, try to work through these things, try to come up with a better life for ourselves. Because more times than not, we went down those roads because something was deplete. And we had an unhealthy relationship with these things because something was deplete. So let's talk about that. You could see the title of the this episode is when is it time to make a change? Because honestly, sometimes when we don't do anything and we're far from the point where we say, I got to do something about this now, it is a question. When is it time to, to make a change? When honestly, in my case, and in the case of a lot of people that watch this program, it should be when it is time to make a change. So it's not a question anymore. It's when it is time to make a change because we are making changes. We are not fearful of making change. We are ready to make changes because we realize that what we were doing was harming us. So four components to tonight's show. Um, how did I know when it was time? How did I know it was time? started talking about that, but we'll talk about that a bit more um, in mere seconds. The next piece of this is the six signs it is time to make a change. There are, there are a couple of really good authors out there that have provided guidance on this, and we'll talk about exactly what they say. And then we're going to talk about the overcoming addiction cycle, the six stages. Uh, because once we realize it is time to make a change, then we need a strategy. We need to figure out a way to handle that. And during this program, as we always do, we'll take your questions and comments. You wonder why I can't talk, uh, why I can't talk straight tonight? It's those pictures on the left-hand side. It's those pictures on the left-hand side. It was my existence in late 2018. The fact that I was that morbidly obese. The fact that for me, that was just passing, and I had no sort of desire to try to fix that. And if I did, I would craft maybe a week or two together, and then I would fall right back off again. The right-hand side is my strength. The right-hand side is where I am now. The right-hand side talks about what putting two and a half years together means as far as what really is, and I've said this before, the realization that there is no alternative because there isn't. The status quo is killing me. So there was no alternative to that. I, I had to go down this road. What were some of the physical effects? And not all of it, but what were some of it? The fact that I couldn't walk more than 10 feet without needing to sit down? especially when I was traveling, trouble sleeping at night, 
panic attacks that I thought were heart attacks. I, I spent at least three or four visits to the ER in 17 and 18 thinking I was having a heart attack and it was just merely a panic attack. But when you're that size and you feel your chest, you know, starting to do things that it shouldn't be doing, you're thinking it's a heart attack and you're looking to go in a hospital. So that's what happened to me. Gout. The fact that I had such a bad sort of system with my, with drainage, that I was forming gout in my feet. Horrible. I had to find ways around that. And if I was trying to put together days where I was doing something physically fit, well, they weren't lasting long because that would rear its head into the game. And then a term or a phrase we're going to talk about a lot in this episode is the lack of satiation. There was definitely a lack of satiation when eating. You know, it's the sort of thing that If I went out to dinner or if I went to a fast food place, I would be ordering one thing and then be thinking immediately about the next thing I'm ordering. Like I wasn't just happy with one meal. If I was going out to a place where I was ordering multiple courses, it wasn't two or three courses. There was like five or six because again, there was no satiation. Now, Biochemically, there could be a reason for that, for the fact that there were artificial sweeteners, this, that, and the other thing, right? We could talk about that for hours. But the reality was that there was no satiation. And that in itself is compulsion. Quick comment from Jamie. It impresses, amazes, floors me every time to see those before and afters. You are amazing. Like, dang. Thank you, Jamie. I appreciate that. And I appreciate you. Thank you. It, um, it, it, these are photos that I look at from time to time. And when I tell my story, I look at them. I may look at them a little while longer than I should, but I just, just sitting here in just amazement that one, I was that size, but two, that I'm not that size anymore. So. Thank you, Jamie, for saying that. So when we think about this from the fact that I used to be this very morbidly obese gentleman and the fact that I lost this weight, I understand that that had to be the first thing that got tackled. Without a doubt, it had to be the first thing that got tackled. But there are other things at play here, other addictions, other compulsions. The next next slide talks about the two lumped together because I think there's really a like sort of trigger for both of them. So that's why they're lumped together. And that's that of, wow, there we go. Alcoholism and gambling. A picture of a video poker game in the upper left-hand corner, a picture of Widow Jane in the lower right, left-hand corner. Uh, A mock petition for bankruptcy in the upper right-hand corner. I couldn't find anything that was de-identified, so I had to go with a stock photo. And then me pouring the Zambuca down the drain in the lower right-hand corner. The funny thing about getting rid of this house of the alcohol was that it was something that did not happen right away, if you remember the story. It was something that I was very confident in, in not having it be a problem. And then we were dealing with all we were dealing with in 2020 and I had to do what I had to do because I think if it stayed in the house and I didn't have the right mindset, I would have gone back to it. That's just truth. So I was glad to get rid of it. It was a painful exercise, mind you, to get rid of it, pouring all of that down a drain and then giving the rest to a dear friend of mine. But it had to happen. If I was going to keep my sobriety, which I am proud, I am proud to be sober. That had to happen. As far as the economic peril of gambling way too much. Well, the only way around that is filing for Chapter 13 bankruptcy. It is not a laughing matter. It is something I will be fighting for for the next four and a half years. But... 
it's something that at the end of that path, it puts me in a financial situation where I can start to live a more responsibly active financial life. I could have a retirement. I could do this. I could do that. If I kept on going down that road with 14 or 15 different credit cards and living a life that was very much paralyzed financially by credit card credit card vend, uh, credit card uh, debtors and whatnot, there was no way around it. And you throw in the question of a mortgage and you throw in the question of leasing a car and you throw this and you throw that, it becomes a very tough exercise. So that is the financial peril, but with a plan that was approved, chapter 13, and then by the next four and a half years and the end of, you know, the next 54 payments to have to be made, I'll be taken care of with respect to that. But I had to get down that road first and foremost. But we, there again, we talk about that satiation word. There was a lack of satiation when drinking. There was a la lack of satiation when gambling. There was a bottle of bourbon by the coffee maker at the height of this. Why was there a bottle of bourbon next to the coffee maker at the height of this? Was things that bad that I needed to put my, a little, little bourbon in my morning coffee? Well, that's how it was. That's how bad it was. And then, you know, consumption with both activities. We talk about... You know, I made mention of Fibonacci last week, but it really becomes that sort of paradigm in the sense that one is never enough. One becomes two, two becomes four, four becomes eight, so on and so forth. You know, you take the gambling example for a second. No, you know, when you have that sort of capability, you're not you're not playing with small stakes because there's no satiation. So it it just really is something where it's very hard to believe. And it's something that I have to always be remembering of that. I always have to keep that in, in full focus. I'm gonna go back to Maine for a second because a couple things popped up. Um, Marilyn said, there is no words for what you've achieved and changed in your life. You're in such inspiration to all. Thank you, Marilyn. I appreciate that. Jamie says, if you want to, if I want to answer, how do you, uh, how do you fare with body image? Uh, because I lost quite a bit of weight. Sometimes I still feel like I am not thin enough, but then other times I, next one, I feel like I'm too thin. It's odd. It's uh, dysmorphia. Uh, and there have been periods of time throughout the last two and a half years where I've dealt big time with body dysmorphia. And when I'm not feeling positive about myself, there are times I still see myself in the mirror, albeit not a lot anymore, that I still see a very large gentleman. Whereas the reality is, here's someone who is less than 200 pounds. It's less than 190 pounds now. And it's far from a 480 number or a 470 number. But every now and then, because of stress or this or whatnot, I still see pieces of that. So it's not outside the realm of possibility. The way I think we work around that is we must remember our path. We must take confidence in what we do, but we also have to rid ourselves of any stressors and any sort of roadblock that sits in our way. And we have to stay confident in ourselves. We have to love ourselves. We have to take pride in ourselves because our strength, love, and wisdom begins inside every single time without question. Saren says, hi. Hi, Saren. How are you? Saren has a question. How do you feel about the economic class divide for filing bankruptcy. There is one. And there is one that honestly is suffocating. Uh, the rules between 7 and 13 aren't, aren't legitimized enough, I will say, for sure. Um, so I, t I totally get your point there, Saren. I think in the case of 13, the case that I'm in, the rules and means tests are really tough. They're not they're not easy by any stretch of the imagination and they're not supposed to be because there's a list of creditors that want their money. So there is a plan to try to construct that. When you're talking about a situation when you're in a seven and there is no wage earning 
it then becomes a situation where you're sacrificing a lot of things to satisfy the debtors. But there's protection within the U.S. bankruptcy court for that. That said, there is still a great divide, Saren. There is no question about that. And I think as when we talk socioeconomics for a second, yeah, there is a major divide. Is there any sort of program where we could start talking about UBI? We could start talking about things where we can help propel that? Yeah, there should be more conversations about that. They haven't taken any sort of fruition. And I don't mean to show I don't mean for the show to be political for a second, but yeah, UBI should be a thing, especially when there's a great disparity between minimum wage and the poverty line. We need to take better representation of that. We need to have a better ear to that. The reality is, when the economics are out of control right now, and it is becoming next to impossible, I wouldn't say next to impossible, but getting there, to find anything at fair market value for rent right now, we got a problem on our hands. And then when you have the protections that were in for the, I'll say it this time, the Backstreet Boys reunion tour, I know there's some people that are looking for that. There you go. Um, and that have to go away, like the CARES Act and whatnot, and just basically revoking the moratorium within a moment's notice without any sort of phase sort of approach, no sort of tapered approach, that is economically irresponsible. So Saren, I absolutely agree with you. Sarah says, the cities that have tested UBI shows that it works really well. Yeah. I think it should be a calculated sort of thing where we know where the minimum wage is. We know where the poverty line is. We know where the true sort of line is. So we take in the, the sort of consumption of the median sort of apartment and the median sort of expense, this, that, and the other thing, and make a very calculated number for people to live life, to put a roof over their head, to put food on the table. So... Yeah, UBI definitely shows that it works really well in the cities that have enacted it. I would love to see it expanded. And that might come as a shock to some of the viewers of this show, but that is my stance on it. Um, I never said I was one, one side of the house or the other. I am down the middle. And with respect to being down the middle, I am pro-UBI. You're welcome, Saren. So going back to figuring out when it is time to make a change, the sort of things that we keep in the back of our mind and realizing that it is time to make a change. Oh, I forgot one up here. Good morning, Easy. I didn't even see your comment up there. I hope you're doing well. Okay, go back to uh, going back to the graphics. So we talk about alcoholism and gambling and the sort of sort of factors that are underneath all of that. The next piece of this is throwing an IFS term for a second, an internal family systems term for a second, is identifying the firefighters and the reasons why I went down that road. And it's basically three questions, right? What caused me to take up those behaviors? What was, what was I getting out of these behaviors? And where was my mind during these behaviors? What was the sort of short-term Gain what short ser, short uh, short ser, short term satiation. Try saying that five times fast. Short term satiation. Moreover, what is the long term gain out of this? Um, not an easy question to answer when you're dealing with compulsion. There is no long term. It's all short term, and it's it is a phony short term. It's a firefighter. It's basically filling a gap that is basically put in there or basically is trying to cover something that is hurting us with something that is hurting us even more. So trying to figure out exactly what the firefighters are, but moreover, why one would gravitate to those firefighters. I, I have to be honest, this could be best discovered in therapy, which was something that was very important to me in 2019. And it's something that I am still very religious about as far as seeking therapy on a regular basis. It's part of taking care of this up here. We know how to see a doctor when we don't feel well. 
We know how to see a neurologist when there's something going on with their central nervous system, keeping it local for a second. We also have to seek mental help, therapy, that sort of thing, either by way of psychiatry or, you know, licensed client, uh, <laughs> licensed clinical worker, LCW, that sort of thing. Yeah, those photos really got to me. Um, let's see. So there are six signs and, uh, live purpose, live purposefully now.com and L summer has a great list here. Basically the six for those of us that have gone down this road is not that much of a shocker, but one, you've forgotten that you have choices. And I think when we're knee deep in something and we are really feeling the hurt of it, we forget the fact that we do have choices. We forget the fact that we are deservant of the best. We, we need to take care of ourselves. We need to love ourselves first. Airplane mask, cabin pressure gone, cover yourself first, that thing. Let, you let minor irritations become major problems. Yeah. Making mountains out of proverbial molehills. That is something when we lose that sort of focus, we lose that sort of centrality. That's a problem. When it's hard to stop obsessing over what was the past, that's another thing. We can't live in the past. We learn from the past, but we're not to dwell upon the past. And then I guess the next thing is when you're saying, why me, why me, why me, instead of asking a question like, what's next? Like, let's try to figure this out instead of being, woe is me? Uh, a couple of folks that have watched the show regularly says the victim personality, the victim, the victim persona. Absolutely. That's what that is. When we are a victim, nothing good can come out of that. When we decide to take action, that's when we have a chance to do something about it. And then the last one is that there's no spring to your step. There's no joy in your heart and that the passion is gone. When you feel, I would say, dare I say, depressed, that's a sign there's a problem. And if what you're dealing with is causing that, well, that in itself is a major issue. A couple comments. Saren says, therapy is mind and soul food. Yeah, it certainly is. It is as, as beneficial and as, I would say, required as seeing a doctor. At least I'm speaking on behalf of me, but I, I can definitely vouch for that. Sarah says, I'd like to hear about the firefighters in more detail. And I plan to do a whole episode on internal family systems either this Thursday or next week. Because we've talked about firefighters and managers a lot on this show, but we haven't gone into it at great lengths. We'll talk about the firefighters. We'll talk about one, a couple of key texts with respect to internal family systems, but then moreover, what firefighting meant for me specifically, what managing meant for me specifically, and how I deal with the two. We will, we will definitely do that. And Saren says, obsession with then or there instead of now. Exactly. We live in the now. We don't live tomorrow. If we're worried about tomorrow, that's anxiety. If we worry about yesterday and we just dwell upon yesterday, that's depression. We have to live in the now. Those are the six signs. So there are many different thoughts about how to come up with a strategy to tackling this from an addiction sort of perspective. Because again, a lot of what we talk about on the show and a lot of the things I've dealt with for the last two and a half years is addiction. It basically is four pieces to that. There's free, uh, pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, and action. Now there are different, six different stages to it, but it basically comes to pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, and action. When everything's working correctly, and you're in action and you start maintaining what you've produced through hard work and whatnot, 
that is the bona fide goal of all this, isn't it? But we'll talk about exactly how you go from pre-contemplating something to contemplating something to preparing to do something about it to actually doing something about it. A couple of comments real quick. Easy says, the way I got myself out of that stuff was I was totally honest with myself and uh, when I first sobered. That's honesty and transparency is the most important thing we can do without question. He, he goes on and says, I took responsibility of my part in all resentment, all resentments in my life by honestly looking at what part I played in such situations. Yes. Transparency, but also realization and owning up to things. You know, most of us take a look at the steps, so to speak, but I think taking a full honest look of what we have done, taking a full understanding of that, but also figuring out how we can move past that and also making amends and working through that. That is very important. In addition to IFS, uh, Sarah, I do want to have an episode about the steps at some point too. We did one back in season one, but I think it's time for us to do another episode about the steps. So we will do that too. So when you think about this, I'll go back to, um, uh, he had uh, easy, had one more comment. Once I got honest, my delusional self and the stories I believed that went wrong and it was everyone else's fault until I took responsibility of my actions. Freedom came to me and the past no longer haunts me. Exactly. Exactly. But you have to remember that you were the one that was doing it to yourself. We have to take responsibility for that. I was the one hitting the video poker machine or playing craps. I was the one drinking. I was the one overeating. I was the one sitting in a drive through lane at a fast food place for fifth or sixth meal of the day. It was me that did it. No one else did it but me. We take responsibility for that. So when we think about this, when we're in pre-contemplating this, we're definitely living in a state of denial. We always joke around that denial is a long river, <laughs> right? That old adage, denial is horrible. When you're knee deep in denial, nothing gets done. Denial could be the thing that can basically prevent us from getting any sort of path forward. It's that question of when do we go from the pre-contemplation to contemplation? What sort of triggers occur or positive triggers or positive things that happen? We always talk about the negative, but here's a positive thing. What sort of realization that made us realize, hey, it's time for us to take action. In my case, it's the bottoms, right? We talked about the bottoms before, but with respect to the overeating, that's an obvious one. Being 480 pounds is definitely a bottom. When I couldn't walk more than 10 feet was definitely a bottom. When you were having problems with every single aspect of your life, with physical appearance, physical movement, it was a problem. There's bottom number one. Bottom number two would be the fact that you take on this giant challenge of losing a very large amount of weight and it's not coming off real quickly and you still found time during the week to go drink. And that was the MO between January and May of 2019. The bottom in question was a very bad night at a Mexican restaurant. Two pitchers of jalapeno cucumber margaritas, Manhattans, bourbon, wine, and a very rude surprise at 3.45 in the morning to the point where you didn't feel right for the next week afterwards. Bloodshot eyes and nauseous for at least four or five of those days. There's bottom number two. Bottom number three with respect to the gambling, well, we'll talk about it real quick again and the fact that I got audited. The fact that financially I'm ruining myself, but also any sort of relief that I got from the CARES Act was going to go away. And I had to take responsibility for it. And realizing that at 43, now 44 years of age, I am not in a good financial state. And I'm using something as, I'll say, it, as silly 
as gambling to bide my time. I mean, it was a thing that was part of my life for a very, very long time. And going back to the key word of satiation for a second, no matter what I was doing for a living, no matter where I was from a, from a financial standpoint, that was more money that was being blown on us. It was horrible. It hurts me to even talk about it. But that was my life. And that was a bottom that went by way of Uncle Sam knocking on the door, sending registered mail and going down that road. So, yeah. Ingi says, denial, also unaware, it's also addiction, uneducated. Yeah. Fear of the unknown. Fear of the unknown makes us do the most foolish things, doesn't it? And Easy says, I was the problem of my own making. Yeah. When we talk about these sort of things, whether it is the gambling or the overeating or the alcoholism, that was a problem of our own making. But we had to be honest. Had to be absolutely honest about it. Easy also says, I had to take a look at the underlying problem, my alcoholism and overeating. Yeah, the two work in tandem. It's compulsion. It's addiction. Yeah. And I will say this, and I, I still remain very steadfast. I think when you have an overeating problem and you also have an alcoholism problem, one causes more havoc with the other. Certainly it was the case with me. I'm sure it is the case with many. But it's reality, right? It's how we tackle this. It's how we come up with a life that is removing of these things. That's the question. So when we talk about contemplating its time, hitting those bottoms, and then preparing, that's when we start saying, okay, now it's time for us to either contact the therapist, in my case, contact the recovery group in, in many people's cases and coming up with the research needed for us to do what we need to do. If it's a question of overeating, finding a diet program and a nutritionist that actually can do something for us. You know, whether you work with a PCP or a doctor and they may know someone, that's one way to do it. When we talk about alcoholism, it's definitely talking about a place where you can get recovery for that. And when we talk about gambling, there's definitely the work of Gamblers Anonymous, or GA. Because again, there is a sort of dopamine drip that's going on with the act of gambling that we have to have better control of. If it's too much, then it becomes a medical question. Fortunately, in my case, it was never too much. I was able to cover that through non sort of medically induced sort of question. No sort of need to go on any sort of taper or any sort of drug to treat this. There are many that do. Even when it comes to a psychological addiction like gambling. And then it's a question of taking action and starting to work the program to get ourselves to a better place, whether it's a question of steps or whatever you're doing. It's actually taking the action to move yourself past it, not living in the past, living in the now. We don't live for tomorrow because it's not guaranteed and we're not anxious about tomorrow either. But we live for today. And hopefully, if you look at the if you look at the cycle over there, we don't talk about relapse. But if we do, we have a plan around that. There's a relapse plan we talk about. We talk about things that we can come up with to protect ourselves in case we fall off. That's just being responsible. Hopefully, when talking about the addictions I've had, talking about the addictions we talk about on the show, it's maintenance. It's action and maintenance and not relapse. But there are plans there in case that ever happens. We have to protect ourselves, right? Our strength, love, and wisdom starts inside every single time. I am very fortunate 
denying even come close with having to invoke that yet. Sober, sobriety for two plus years, promising myself I track food every single day. Are there days where I have, or weekends where I have food sabbaths? Yeah, of course. But in the case of nutrition, you're supposed to give yourself a five to two, six to one sort of ratio anyway. And as far as the gambling, well, there's no rat's chance that that's happening because um, chapter 13, and there's no money. And I I remember the horrible feelings I had doing that day in, day out, trip in, trip out. If we start constructing sort of memories to it, we're better off that way. Sarah says, I don't know anything about relapse planning. We're going to talk about that. Coming up with an, a plan of attack in case relapse occurs, a uh, chain of command, people to know, your sponsor, etc. Yeah. We'll talk about relapse planning on a future episode as well. Easy says, I had a plan of attack, i.e. 12 steps in accepting spiritual help. I know in my heart, I would have not stayed sober without it. Yeah. We need a plan. We talked about that last week when we talked about self-help. We need a plan. We're working through taking care of ourselves. We should always have a plan. In case of relapse, guess what? There's a plan. It's just being responsible for ourselves. It's also loving for ourselves. In Easy's cases, he just said, He'd be dead by now. So we have to plan. But we could talk about the actual construction of a relapse plan. We could actually spend time talking about that on a future episode as well. Jamie says, the program has saved my life, along with connections with amazing people. The community we build is the most important community we can have. It's what we gain off of each other. That strength and love and wisdom we gain off of each other that helps us on the darkest of days. Jamie, you're absolutely right. And I look the same way to you and easy and a lot of you in this room. We, we, ba we basically are strong for each other. We are a community. That's what we do. As easy says, that's no bull. You're right. It is no bull. Uh, let's see. So we talk about the cycle and bring that graphic back up for a second of the question of pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, and in action. And when everything works correctly, we, we live a better life, but we also must plan in case we fall off. That's just being responsible, but that's also loving ourselves and making sure that if it happens, we have a way past it to get back on a cycle and get back to being in a place where we are in action and maintenance. Some resources. We talk about on the, on the top of every show, we talk about SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental uh, Services Health, uh, Mental Health Services Administration. It would help I could spell correctly, right? SAMHSA, S-A-M-H-S-A, SAMHSA. Uh, 1-800-662-HELP. That's 1-800-662-4357. Uh, we also talk about Overeaters Anonymous, Gamblers Anonymous, Alcoholics Anonymous. We could talk about Narcotics Anonymous, any of the anonymous groups. They play a very important factor in recovery, especially when it has been a major portion of our life. Something that was our weakness. Without them, we wouldn't, be getting ourselves to a cleaner place, a healthier place. In the case of AA, I would say that there is a phone number in New Jersey and Pennsylvania and most states to have um, 1-800-GAMBLER is the phone number that you can call that can get you some help. And then there's Psychology Today that you can use to find any therapist in your area. That's a global site. But if you're looking for a therapist to start working at these problems, working at these issues, working at anything, quite frankly, taking care of your mind, 
psychology to psychology today.com. We talked about that last week on the self-help program as well. A couple more questions popped up. Sarah says, can you describe how each of these changes, a uh, change, change stages happen for you? Um, yeah, I can. I think with respect to the overeating, it was a lot simpler because I was dealing with such a massive amount of obesity that I had the mechanisms to know how to lose the weight the first time, the second time, which was going to be time number three. The problem was that my mind wasn't there. It also becomes a question, Sarah, of removing the roadblocks in my way and realizing why I'm overeating, why I'm drinking. There are a lot of, a lot of environmental factors in my life that are causing that. And yeah, I will say it. it was a home life that wasn't great. And again, that's a lot to do with me. There was a, a codependency majorly. I think when you're 480 pounds and I, I humorously call myself being sloth-like, you become a sloth. You take no responsibility. You, you become a mere shadow of yourself. It's horrible. I think realizing that going down the dieting road was the most important thing we can do, or I can do. I know the mechanisms that I had to do to start tackling it. It was then a question of getting the solidification of my doctor and a nutritionist to solidify that. So that's, that's the overeating piece. As far as the alcoholism piece, same thing. In the sense that I was working with an outreach group I was working with my therapist as well, especially when we talk about the chaos of last year and the fact that, okay, the sickness of what you felt in May of 2019 can only propel you for so long before you start wondering, hey, you have to do something about this now. So that's that. And as far as gambling, well, that in itself, my therapist and a Gamblers Anonymous group out of California has helped me out greatly. Sarah then asks, what did you do for preparation? Figuring out exactly what I could do and how. Realizing that I can't do everything all at once. Realizing what the 800 pound, well, horrible analogy, but the biggest problem was taking care of that and then starting working, starting to work from there. It's obvious what the biggest problem was. In my case, it was the overeating. It was not having good sort of relationship with health as far as intake and exercise or lack thereof, and then working from there. The one thing we have to realize, Sarah, is that we can't tackle everything all at once, but we have to figure out what is the most pressing, what is the critical path that we have to take care of before we could start taking care of everything else. Sarah says, it's amazing to me that you did all of this during lockdown. Like my board says, there's no alternative. And the fact that I've lost a weight twice before, I know the mechanism that I had to use to get there. As far as everything else, it was starting to make realization of things. Realizing where I have pockets of codependency, pockets of unhealthy relationship, all of that. It was very hard. And even then, when you go down a path to start to fix these things, there are things that spring up that attack us as well, whether it's by our own doing or what have you. It's being true to yourself, being strong, but then also realizing that there's only one of us. The love that we have, the strength that we have begins within every single time. Hey, Sammy, how are you? Hope you're doing well. Marilyn says it's important that we have a plan so we don't beat ourselves up and fail. Easy says, speaking for myself, I had to concede to my innermost self that we are alcoholics, overeaters, drug addicts, and had to find a power that will get me out of what I was and to be set free. Yes. Yes, exactly. And we could talk about that from a spiritual sort of perspective. We could talk about that from 
any sort of perspective. I like to use the I like to use the universe as my sort of central sort of power in the sense that we have to do what's right for us. When we do what's right for us and we follow the sort of edicts of all of that and file fire find ourselves in that sort of solidification, I would say, I'm trying to find the best word to use. I think we're better off that way. When we take care of ourselves correctly, when we love ourselves correctly, we do nothing but healthy things for us. What we could do for this world is amazing. But it takes a long time to get there, right? Saren says, it's like looking at an ER patient to look at what is critical so you can work on what's deeper inside. Yeah. Would I call it triaging? Yeah. It's like triaging a bit. Figuring out what is the most critical mass, starting to work at that, and then seeing how everything else falls off too. Sarah says, that's the thing. When you start working in this stuff, all kinds of ghosts start appearing. It's frightening, and it's easy to want to self-medicate the fear. Yeah. This is not easy. The change is the toughest thing we can do. But we also have to remember that when something is wrong in the long term in our health, whether mental or physical or what have you, is being hindered, we have to do something about it. Easy says, so do I, John. I had a struggle with spirituality. I looked around and I saw mud, soil, rocks, trees, sky, cloud, universe had to come from somewhere. And then he thought a few years back. Also says, I will seek whatever is out there. Yeah. Always looking for a sign. Always believing in the universe. Whether it's a question of angels or a question of a sign, you do whatever you feel is closest to you. I don't, I don't talk about one specific religion or one specific theology specifically. You figure out what is right for you and you march towards that. Saren says, that's why it's important not to do it alone. Yeah, we need to do it within a community. We need, it, we need each other. If we don't have each other, it is a horrible thing to try to take on ourselves. I will say this, though. When we talk about the wonderment of 2020, is that another way of putting it? Yeah. The work that you find through recovery groups online by way of either Sober James, shameless plug, or a recovering addict, or a real recovery with Nicole, or a bounty of others. The work that they've all done have been immense because when we are in lockdown and when we can't have our normal lives and everything is a giant question mark, to have a community around us to make us stronger is the most important thing we can do. It's something that I hope I can carry out through this program as well. Something that has become very near and dear to me, without question. Hi, Sarah. Hope you're well. She says, this is so good, John. I see these same issues in my hoarding clients. Yeah. It's addiction. And it's also trying to figure out why we're hoarding. What sort of questions are underneath that as well. Inge says, self-medicating for real. Yeah. Yeah, I don't want to throw an IFS term out before we actually do an episode on, on IFS, but a firefighter is something negative that we do to fill in a gap. We also talk about things called managers that we could fill in gaps that are positive, benevolent behaviors, as long as they are done within reason. One can make the argument that exercise and going to the gym and physical fitness can be a manager, but if you overdo it, it then becomes a firefighter in the sense that now we're putting ourselves in potential physical harm because we are overdoing something. You know, the old adage, it's always about moderation. Yeah, it's always about moderation, even when it comes to physical fitness. That's when a, that's when a manager becomes a firefighter, for sure. Uh, Sarah says, yeah, nature always works for me. Yep, indeed. Uh, easy then goes to say, nature is beautiful, Sarah, like going in there and listening it's when he hears birds not singing, um, he walks out of the woods, LOL. 
Um, Jamie says, you definitely are an advocate and a great example of resilience and recovery. Thank you, Jamie. You know, it's it's been, this has not been easy. <laughs> not by any stretch of your imagination, it's not been easy. You throw in other things like the fact that I'm dealing with MS now. Yeah, this has not been easy. But it also is a testament to me putting one foot in front of the other one step at a time, right? I'm doing this because I think at this point in my life, the love that I have inside is the most important love I have had in a very long time. And I don't have other sort of forces around me that are bending my frame too far out of what it should be. And when I see that, I take action on that immediately. We have to protect ourselves first and foremost, always. Easy says, hoarding, just in case I need it. Not anymore. I threw out about five tons of junk out of the garage and backyard in the past six weeks. Yeah. If you don't see any sort of utility for it, get rid of it. And Saren says, it's not just self-medicine. There is also self-harm addiction. It's my sex part of sex and love addiction. Yeah. Sex addiction is very much a real thing. So... Again, we may come to a point where that becomes a firefighter and we have to address why we're gravitating to that. It becomes the same sort of exercise that we've talked about with respect to the overeating and the gambling and the alcoholism. All of that becomes the same exercise. Identifying it, preparing, and taking action. It's important. And if we're in denial, well, then that's the time where we're hoping for that sign, that sort of thing that makes us realize we got to change it. We have to change it. It's, um, this also, also goes back to the thought that we must be on top of our mental health, whether by way of therapists or psychiatrists or what have you, we have to, I think with everything that's going on right now, you wonder why services like BetterHelp, et cetera, are inundated right now, it's because we have all come to that realization that we need therapy. We do. And that wasn't a shameless plug for BetterHelp. It was the first thing I could think of on top of my mind. But yeah, absolutely. You know, it's not been, it's not been an easy story. But I'll say that the more I talk about it, the better I feel solidified in this. So thank you for watching and listening and being part of this. I, you are my community and I appreciate all of you. I, I love all of you for sure. So thank you. Uh, Easy says, um, I understand my soul was empty and I was always looking for, f for fulfillment he found it with alcoholism, sex, drugs, technology, going for meetings, uh, going to meetings, 20 meetings per week. Yeah. Meeting makers make it, right? That's what they say. That's exactly right. And Engie says uh, she has to go on a PTSO Zoom. Thank you. Thank you, Engie, for showing up. Thank you for being a part of this wonderful community. Thank you for being the incredible person that you are. Jamie says, you help us as much as we help you. Yes, absolutely. Major heart here to all of you. And Easy says, but today my soul is fulfilled about 70%. I'm not perfect, but it is not easy sometimes feeling full uh, in my soul. I'm always seeking for something to fill me. Yeah. It's never going to be 100%. That's, that's perfection. We're human beings. Not perfect. But the thing is, if we could put our, our best thought out there, our best foot out there, we can come close. We could grow asymptotic to 100%. Throwing a math term in there for a second, right? We can come as close as we can. So that's absolutely well put easy. Um, let's talk about Thursday real quick. We had an interview scheduled for Thursday, but it looks like that might be moving. So if... Um, if the interview doesn't happen, we will probably continue this discussion by way of starting to talk about those sort of internal mechanics of 
in, internal mechanics. I was going to say internal family systems. I say mechanics got the two combined, right? The mechanics of internal family systems, but also the other things of coming up with a recovery plan and a relapse plan and all of that. We'll talk about that on Thursday if the interview doesn't happen, which I suspect it might not happen, and I'll be rescheduled. Uh, keep an eye on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch to see exactly what the topic will be on Thursday. But it's either going to be an interview or it's going to be a continuation of that portion of the conversation for sure. Basically, IFS, recovery plans, relapse plans, and the like. And then Friday, we will have another VF Talk. So the Thursday show will be at 8 o'clock Eastern, 5 o'clock Pacific. And then VF Talks will be at 6.30 Eastern, 3.30 Pacific, where we talk about anything and everything with Matt Haas and Paul Burke and all of you. I um, It's the best part of the week, if you ask me. I enjoy it so much, and I enjoy all of you having a good time with us, too. But until next time, I'm going to say the same thing I say at the end of every Venture Forward or VF Talks. Stay safe. Stay sane. Stay strong. Stay sober. You're worth it. We'll see you again Thursday night at 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific, for the next episode of The Venture Forward. Have a wonderful night and fly be free.